We've been running a leadership development path for the last two years here in this church. And you can, you can sign up, you can register for it uh, once a year, basically. So basically, we start in February next year. You can't register in March, you can't register in June or July. You need to register for, Je- for February, okay? So from any time from now on until February, you can register for that. And these are five Saturday mornings. And what we do in the leadership development path, what has been really encouraging, and you know my heart and you know how I preach for this, that we engage in what God has called us to be on Mondays. And so most of the people doing the leadership development path are taking that leadership input and uh, uh, upskilling, as it were, for their workplace, for where God has placed them. So I want to encourage you, don't think of this only in terms of a church ministry, but think about, uh, about your ministry where God has placed you and you could receive some input and upskilling. Find somebody that's doing the, the leadership development path already. They're super excited and buzzing about it. It's such a great resource for you. And I want to encourage you to, to find out more, sign up for that. Come and ask us about it. Head to the information point or online. Now, the other thing is you are sitting on or sitting next to or you're holding this in your hand or you've tucked it on the floor but this is our christmas concert friends this is what's happening this yeah it is november this is december okay so this year as you know space is a a little bit of a challenge for us at the moment so what we're doing for christmas concert we're heading to castle green and it's not on a sunday all the services will not be happening on a sunday that day they will be on the saturday So we're gathering on the Saturday for our Christmas concert. This is an excellent opportunity to bring friends and relatives and those that want to come to church at Christmas time. You know what it's like. So uh, a simple charge of one pound a ticket. That's to help us organize and to know what the the, the space that we're going to require. So you can do that with a QR code there or head over to the website. Can I encourage you to do that? The proceeds of that are going to go to St. Francis Hospice. So the, the, the finance for this is simply to make it run smoothly. Okay, so... Uh, it enables us to do the ticketing in an orderly way. So December the 14th, 5 p.m. It's going to be a great day, friends. Consider already who you're bringing to our Christmas uh, concert. And if we book out, we'll just do another show, okay? If there'll be a second concert, if this one fills up. So let's do it. Give me another... I, t- I tell you every year, create, make my life difficult. Make it difficult for us. Let's do this. Now, let me get to introducing our guest speaker today. We have a guest speaker. Uh, last time Andrew McCourt was with us was actually five years ago uh, when uh, I took on the role as lead pastor in this church. So it's been a little while. Now you need to know something about Andrew. I know Andrew for, I'm working out Andrew, I think it's about 34 years now. We, we studied together. Uh, we got married when we left college. Uh, the wonderful Isabel is here. Yeah, not, we didn't get married, sorry. We got married a month apart from each other today. Our two wonderful wives are here at the front of the church today. So <laughs> let's make that really clear. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, but the wonderful thing is Andy's here with us. He, he really has an incredible anointing in the Word of God. Not just to share the Word of God, but to th- th- you can catch something of what God, God's heart, okay? And they are currently serving. They've been over in California for quite some time now. You'll hear from his accent in a minute. They're not Californian, and, uh, but they have been doing an amazing work, been part of Bayside Church, which is a, quite simply an enormous church uh, and doing incredible impact in that part of Northern California. But the last couple of years, they've been starting a new church in Orange County, which is so exciting. Uh, much that we can learn from how they're developing things there. But I want us to be able to give Andrew a very warm Dagnum welcome. Can we do that today? Thank you so much. How's everybody doing? Great to see you this morning in church. Uh, We had a service this morning at 8.45. My goodness, those people, they came with coffee in them already. They were good. Well, again, as I got and said, my name is Andrew. As you can hear from my accent, I am not from California. I'm not from East London. I'm from God's country, everybody. I'm from Ireland, yes? And you need to listen carefully. I always say this because this is how you're going to talk in heaven. This will be the language (laughs) of heaven. I actually married a French woman. Ooh la la. And uh, yes, 
So uh, we, we were married 30, we're married for 31 years, uh, and uh, I always say that Isabel is the hero in the story. She is the hero in the story. Last year when we celebrated 30 years, um, I said, darling, you deserve a medal, and she said, a ring will do. That's what, all I want is a ring. I don't need a medal or anything like that. So we got four children. We've got Ben, who's 28, and he is married to the wonderful Kalina, and they just made us grandparents. Uh, yes, we're excited about that. And then we've got Dan, who's 25. He lives in New York. And then Abigail, our daughter, who we'll see later on today, uh, she lives here in London, came back and studied in London. Um, we'll see her. She's 21. And then Nathan, who's 20 years old. And he's like an evangelist to America. And he's trying to convert them to real football. Not soccer, real football. You all with me, everyone? Yes? Let's, let's hold on. Let's stick to the truth. But what a joy it is to be here today. As Khan said, we are in uh, California. We live in America. And America is going a little cray-cray. It's going a little crazy at the moment, yes? And here's the good news. Politics is not the answer. Do we all agree on that? Jesus is the answer. And for America, California, I don't care where you live in the world, we live here in East London. Here's the truth is that Jesus Christ is the answer. And we can say that, oh, Jesus is the answer. Well, where is Jesus? Here's the truth is, Jesus is inside of you. And this is one thing that I'm convinced of. If we were all a little bit more like Jesus, I believe that we could have the greatest impact in the world. Now, when I say the world, what do I mean by the world? I mean the 8 billion people that live on the planet? No, I believe in the 8 people that you relate to in your life on a daily basis, whether it be your family member, your work colleagues, the people that are on your text thread. Who are they? They're the people that you're going to impact with your life. A lot of people say to me, Andrew, I'm not the best evangelist in the world. And that's true. We're not the best evangelist in the world. That was like people like Billy Graham and Gawain, and they're incredible evangelists. But you're the best evangelist in your world. And the people that you know, you work with, with your neighbors and all of that. And here's the truth. I'm convinced of this. If we were all more like Jesus, we're going to help change our world, yes? And that's what I want to talk about. So I'm going to talk about today, to be like Jesus. I'm going to read here from Luke chapter 4. And it says there in verse 14, Jesus returned. Where did he return from? He returned from the wilderness. He returned to Galilee in what? In the power of the... Come on, everyone. If you don't know the answer, just say Jesus. That's church, all right? <laughs> He returned in the power of the Spirit, okay? And news about Him spread through the whole countryside. Wouldn't it be great news if the good news of Jesus Christ spread through the whole country that every single person in East Dagenham was talking about Jesus Christ? That would be good news, wouldn't it? And He was teaching in their synagogues and everyone praised Gawain. No. Who did they praise? There's only one celebrity in the church, everyone, and his name is Jesus Christ. His name is Jesus. So what is it to be like Jesus? Well, first of all, to be like Jesus means to be full of the Spirit. As I said, I live in California, and sometimes I get to do this. I get to fly in somewhere and preach. And because I'm a pastor, okay, normally at the end of the flight, I get to rent a car, and it's not always a great car. It's just like entry-level car, all right? And in America, we got like weird mix over there, and and this one here is normally the one that I get. It's a Chevy Malibu, and it is the worst car in the world. No one has ever woken up in the morning and said, I'd love to buy a Chevy Malibu. No one's ever said those words. Never been uttered, everyone. It's more like a hairdryer with four wheels. That's all it is, everyone. There's no real power in it. It's just a horrible, horrible car. But it's the car that I get every time because it's the cheapest in the world. That's it, everyone. And one time I was traveling with my two boys, and we landed down, and there we go. Here's, here's your keys to your Chevy Malibu. And they went, Dad, can we not have something more powerful? And, and the girl heard them, and she said, Well, today there's a special offer for an extra $20. That's about two pounds. For an extra $20, everybody. And you can have one of these. Look at this bad boy, everyone. A Dodge Challenger with a five-liter engine inside of that. And they were saying, Dad, do it, do it, do it. And so I, I rented it for the rest of the year. That's what I did, everybody. 
And it was like the most exhilarating experience. And here's the truth, everyone. Why do I talk about that today? Here's the truth. Your life without the person and the power of the Holy Spirit is a Chevy Malibu. But when you get the Holy Spirit inside of you, it's like living with a Dodge Challenger. It's a serious, serious upgrade. And maybe you're here today and you're going, well, I'm a bit nervous because you're talking about the Holy Spirit. And I went to a church and they were all a little bit crazy. Well, don't blame the Holy Spirit on that. The Holy Spirit's so important. He, not it. The Holy Spirit's not an it. The Holy Spirit is a person. It's God the Father, God the Son, and God what? God the Holy Spirit. He is a person. He's not a force. We're not Star Wars, everyone. It's not a Jedi, the force. It's not, I don't know why I did that. But um, so that's a, the Holy Spirit is a person and He is powerful and He is present in our lives. And if you're not sure about this, the Holy Spirit is all over the Bible, especially in the New Testament. Listen to this here. 68 chapters in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And there's 34 references to the Holy Spirit. The Apostle John, he wrote 28 chapters in entirety in the Scripture. And he refers to the Holy Spirit 21 times. And in the book of Acts, there's 28 chapters. And listen to this. 56 references to the Holy Spirit. Then the Holy Spirit is the New Testament strategy. We are born of the Spirit. We are sealed by the Spirit. We bear fruit by the Spirit. We walk in the Spirit. We pray in the Spirit. We use the sword of the Spirit. We use the gifts of the Spirit. We preach in the power of the Spirit, led by the Spirit, comforted by the Spirit. And 2 Corinthians 13, we know the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. How many people think the Holy Spirit is important? Again, some of you, you're on the fence because you went to that weird church. And you hear me talking about the Holy Spirit and it gets you all freaked out a little bit because, you know, they used to blow on people and like slap them in the head and knock them over and do stuff like that. Listen to this. The Holy Spirit doesn't make me weird. The Holy Spirit makes me me, everybody. And if you're weird, that's on you. You're just weird. Can I ask you, stop being weird, people in the balcony. Don't be weird anymore. We don't need weird. We just need to be, and we were always taught this, to be naturally supernatural. Yes. It's just who we are, everyone. We just walk around every single day in our lives. And whether I'm in my Doc Martens, you like my Doc Martens, everybody? Whether I'm in my Doc Martens, in my slippers, or in my bare feet, I'm the same person and the same Holy Spirit is inside of me. And whether I'm at home, whether I'm at work, whether I'm at the side of the football field, wherever I am in life, I have the Holy Spirit inside of me. Uh, I took Isabel out on a date because that's what a good man does, everybody. That's what a good man does. And I didn't take her to that Scottish restaurant, McDonald's. I brought her to somewhere, somewhere really good, everyone. I brought her, uh, we went to a little place near us called Balboa Island. It's really quaint. And our little Swiss restaurant there that we like, we go there at least once a year. And, uh, and we're sitting there having food at an outdoor table because you can do that in Southern California without getting frostbite. And, uh, and we were walking away and I heard a, a couple talking in the English accents, all right? And I thought, English, they need Jesus. So I spoke to them. And, uh, and, so, and so I walked up and, and I said, hey, you're from England? And they went, yeah, yeah. And they went, I, they went where are you from? I went, the Holy Land. Ireland. And so, and so we, I, I just said, are, are you here on holiday? And they said, yeah, yeah. I said, where are you by, whereabouts were you from? I said, London. He said, yeah, Richmond. And then everyone, he just lost it. He just started, as we said, Ireland, effing and jeffing. He just like going, and if I have one more beeping American, ask me if I know Ted Lasso. I'm going to smack him in the mm face. And it was just like, whoa. I said, okay, that's all right. And he said, well, why are you here? And before I could answer, he said, don't answer. You're here because of tech. And I said, no, I'm here because of God. And he started effing and jeffing again. Well, don't start preaching at me and all of that. I said, hey, don't worry about that. I said, are you enjoying your food? And he said, I'm loving it, but she's not. I said, do you not like it? He goes, no, she had COVID and she still hasn't got her taste back. And I looked at Isabel and she kind of looked at me and I thought, here's a God moment. And I said, well, would you mind if we prayed for you? But it's going to be the non-weird, non-cringy, non-hyper, eyes open, just like I'm talking type of prayer. 
Why do we get weird when we pray, everybody? I don't do that with my kids. I don't talk to anyone else like that. And so I'm just going to talk to my kids, okay? And so I'm just saying, I said, is that okay? And she went, that would be great. And he looked at me and said, oh, be careful. There could be lightning hit me. So I said, let's pray. And again, I know, so this was quite interesting, by the way. He turned around and he said this. Well, she would like that because she's kind of into that. And I went, well, why do you say that? She goes, I go to church. And I said, what church do you go to? And she goes, I go to Holy Trinity Brompton, where my daughter works, where our daughter works, everybody. I just want to say, there is a God, everyone. He gets this couple to turn off, fly all the way to California, to go to that restaurant, to meet us, everyone, because God wants to reach people through the Holy Spirit. So anyway, I do my uh, non-weird, non-cringe, non-hyper-loud type of prayer, and I'm praying, but he gets weird. He's the one that bows his head in the street and like closes his eyes and does all of that, okay? And I'm just praying and that she would have some healing in her life and whatever. And, this, and the Lord bless my friend as well. And I just pray that you would reveal yourself to him. And at the end, I didn't go, now choir, get on back, give me some keys, okay? Bohemian Rhapsody. Come on, everyone. I want you to do this. And let's, no, it wasn't like that. It was just at the end, I went, and so Jesus, thank you so much. And didn't do it like, amen. Nothing like that. I just did that. And everyone, he lifted up his head and tears are running down his face. And he jumps up and he hugs me and he goes, I think you just converted me. And I want to encourage you with this. God, the Holy Spirit, doesn't just turn up at church on a Sunday morning at one of your 15 services. God, the Holy Spirit, turns up every single day in our lives. God and the Holy Spirit. And I want to encourage you with this. They're really important, everyone. You know, you know, your kids ever ping you because you're not answering your texts? And you get a ping, ping, ping. Come on. Do you know, I believe this, that the Holy Spirit, the more that we open up to the Holy Spirit, you're going to be in McDonald's. You're going to be at work. You're going to be in the, the shopping center. You're going to be in different places. And the Holy Spirit's going to ping you and He's going to pray for them, put an arm around them, ask them, speak a word of life into their hearts. Amen. So, to be like Jesus is what? Is to be full of the Spirit. But also, to be like Jesus is to be full of the Word of God. This is what it says, verse 16. After this, he went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. It's really important. He went back to his world, everyone. Where does the Holy Spirit send you? Sometimes we think, oh, the Holy Spirit, is he's going to send me. It's going to be to Malaysia. It's going to be to Manila. It's going to be somewhere across the world. Normally, what mission means is that we don't cross an ocean. We just need to cross the street. Yes, that's where Jesus went, to where he'd been brought up, to where he went to high school, everyone, where people followed him on Instagram. Everyone knew him. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. Just want to put in there for a second. As was his custom. Jesus went to church, everyone. Regularly. Look at me. Not once every three, four weeks when the kids wake up. He made a habit of going to church. Some of you parents, this this is what we say in America. We used to worship God and play sports, but now we worship sports and play God. And we're taking our kids everywhere. Isn't that right? They're playing rugby on a Monday night, cricket on a Tuesday night. They're swimming while playing chess on a Wednesday night. <laughs> and, like, and we never let them miss. We never, no, you are going to your cricket lesson. No, you are going. I paid money for that. You're going to do it. And then on a Sunday morning, oh, we're all a little bit tired. We're going to have Duvet Cathedral. <laughs> Anyone with me? Okay, if you're watching online, get up and be here next week. (laughs) He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And on rolling it, he found a place where it is what? It is written. And this is important, everyone. Maybe like my first point, oh, to be like Jesus, you need to be full of the Spirit. You, lo- you, know, you really love that. And you were thinking to yourself, oh, yeah, I'm a person of the Spirit. I'm not really a word person. I'm a spirit person. That's, that's nonsense. The Holy Spirit wrote the Word of God. He inspired people. 
And this is important for all of us here today. If you want to develop a great relationship with Jesus, you need to develop a great relationship with the Bible. You can't have a great relationship with... This is not about feelings. It's actually about facts, everybody. That's really important that we grasp that today, that the Bible is the Holy Spirit's book. And I don't think that Jesus was just born with a special chip in him, and like when he was three years old, that he was just quoting Deuteronomy from the front to the back. I don't believe that. I believe that Jesus, like his classmates, needed to go along to yeshiva, to his special school, and learn the Bible. Jesus learned the Bible, and most importantly, Jesus used the Bible. He actually used the Bible because just before this, he was led into the wilderness and he had the biggest spiritual battle of his life outside of Gethsemane and crucifixion. And what does it say? Three times he said, it is what? It is, it is written. It is written. It is written. What did Jesus do? He didn't have like a superpower that we don't have. Jesus had the same things we had. He had the power of the Holy Spirit and he had the power of the Word of God. So we can be like Jesus, everyone. And how does this really come into our lives? Well, Jesus said this on the Sermon on the Mount. We did a series at Bayside. We called it the day that God talked about everything. And if you're here today and you meet someone out there and they go, oh, you know what? I'm not really a Christian, but I love that Sermon on the Mount. They don't. They've never read it. No one loves the Sermon on the Mount. It's highly offensive, everyone. It always like messes with my head. Every time I read it, it messes with my finances. It messes with my emotions. It messes with my sex life, everybody. No one enjoyed that. It's the day that God talked about everything. But he did say this. Jesus said this. Towards the end of it, he turned around and he said this. He said, if anyone hears my words and puts them into action, that's the really thing. Knowing the Word of God is not just knowing it up here, it's living it out. He said, we'll be like the wise man or the wise woman who built their life on the rock, not like on the sand, who built their life on the rock. The Word of God, everybody, is the foundation of the church and is the foundation of every single Christian. And you need the Word of God, because Jesus said this, when you build your life On the Word of God, he said that when the storm comes, not if the storm comes. How many people know there's always storms? You're either in the middle of one, having just come out of one, or here's the good news, you're about to go into one. Because storms are brewing all the time. But if we build our lives on the Word, it gives us a firm foundation. The reality of this was lived out in my father's life. My father left Belfast, 16 years old, and became a Royal Marine for nine years, served the country here, went overseas, did everything. But towards the end of it, he was in a barracks in Portsmouth, and a, and a man called uh, Ted came in, Ted Seymour, came into the barracks, he was a naval missionary, and shared the gospel with my father. My father had no idea about the gospel. I mean, he was degenerate. He was the, like, he was the um, middleweight boxing champion of the Navy at that time, and just was all fists and all mouth, just swearing all the time. This guy confronted him, came back two more times. On the third occasion, he led my dad to Christ. I mean, he was radically saved. So he left the Royal Marines, 1969, he went back to Northern Ireland. And for some people in here that might be mature like me, okay, you might remember that we, our country, Northern Ireland, went into like turmoil and we went into, into absolute conflict where Catholics and Protestants were fighting. And you young Gen Z, it's like, it's hard to imagine this today, but literally we were just like constant bombings. Isabel and I, we planted a church in the city of Derry And one building we used, listen to this here, was bombed 23 times in 25 years. It was absolutely chaos, everybody. So um, when we were kids waking up, we just didn't get into the car. That that didn't happen, everyone. My dad would go out first, get into the car while we stayed in the house, would look under the car to see if there was a bomb, drive it around the street in case there was a tilt switch, and then we would get in the car. That was our daily program. And then 1976, the 31st of December, there was a knock at our front door. And that was always a horrible thing in our house, because that could be, is anyone coming to shoot dad? 
He was a police officer. He was seen as a legitimate target by terrorists. And he always used to stand. The front door was here. He would stand to the side and he would say these words that rattled us as kids. Who's there? And he heard a neighbor's voice. He pulled back the curtain and there was the neighbor and he opened the door and the neighbor said, Derek, I think, and boom, our street was blowing up. Terrorists had planted a bomb in our street trying to kill police officers and prison officers. And down the street, neighbors had been knocking on doors just trying to, you know, alert people. And uh, this young couple picked up their little 18-month-old boy called Graham, and he was killed by the shrapnel of that bomb. Dad was the first police officer in the scene. You can only imagine just the chaos. Seven months later, in the line of duty, he was out one day dressed in just ordinary clothes because he was a detective, and he was chasing terrorists who had robbed a bank doing some fundraising. And uh, he had his gun out, and he shouted, halt or I'll fire, but before this, he had called for backup. And the backup was a police Land Rover. Some of you remember, remember these images from the news, all armor-plated. And in the back, there was two young soldiers trying to help the police. And one of them, an 18-year-old Gordon Highlander, saw my father. And then just in the turmoil and the tension of the moment, he saw a young man in ordinary clothes with a gun on his hand and thought my father was a terrorist. And from a distance of 13 feet, shot him with the most powerful rifle in the world. The bullet hit him in the chest, went straight through his body almost severed his right arm from his body, left a hole the size of two fists in his chest, and somehow he survived. Somehow, we just do not know, somehow he survived, and everyone, he's still alive. We just celebrated his 81st birthday. His 81st birthday. And that was on Friday. And here's the truth. Normally, when you go through like, you know, that sort of trauma and tragedy and burying so many of his colleagues, terrorists dying in his arms as well, just like trauma, 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 you know what you would expect when you turn up at the birthday party to get it like a, a grumpy, toxic, bitter old person that you're scared to bring the grandchildren to, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Just sitting in the corner, like Father Jack, I don't know if you remember him, drinking, just fighting and kicking and hitting on people. No, 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 no. He's full of joy, everybody. Full of love. Oh, very real things happen to him in his life. But guess what? His life is built on the Word of God. Built on the Word of God. And it keeps your heart soft and it keeps your heart tender. What makes Christians different than anybody else? Well, uh, well, well we, we don't go to nightclubs and we don't do drugs most of the time. And, uh, you know, uh, we don't watch porn and, don't, and we're not pimps. That's us. And, and we just keep our houses tidy and we mow our lawns with a Wembley stripe. That's not Christianity, everyone. That's middle class. Yes, that's just middle class. Christianity is this. That we go through the same stuff that everyone else goes through, but we go through with the person of the Holy Spirit inside of our lives with a confidence that we have the truth and we have a foundation that will help us. That's what it is to be a Christian. So, to be like Jesus, is to be full of the Spirit, to be full of the Word. And the last thing here today is, isn't it great when the preacher says the last thing? You're like, wow, we're going to see the football united are playing today. God's team. Oh, stop it, you. Security, front row, please. Deliver him. And so to be like Jesus is to be focused on mission. This is what Jesus read. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because... He wants to give me goosebumps on my goosebumps and give me like really ecstatic experiences. No, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because He has anointed me to what? To proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. People today, and maybe you're in this room, you're, 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 you're a prisoner to fear. You're a prisoner to addiction, whatever it is in your life. You're a prisoner to past hurt in your life. You're a prisoner in this room. Jesus has come to set you free and recovery of sight to the blind, those that can't see a future, those that can't see a way in their marriage or in their community, to set the oppressed free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. 
You see, if you or an I are going to be like Jesus, we're not just full of the Spirit. We're not just full of the Word. We're full of mission. The Spirit sends us forward into the world to bring good news. So I do love America. America has many great things. It's got, it's got incredible ice cream. Oh, really good ice cream in America. It's got other great stuff like um, ice cream. And no, it's a great country. It really is a great country. And I've tried like to fit in as best as I can to America. And I tried to learn American football, which is not football, okay? It's handball. That's what it is. And it's not even a ball, everyone. And so I'm like, uh, I'm there. I'm trying to learn this so much. And I just can't do it. I can't do it. I've, I've sat down with people. I just don't have the spiritual gift of NFL. I don't have it in my life. And they've tried to teach me, well, it's just two teams. And I'm going, right, well, there's two teams. I went, well, no, it's not two teams because that team just all ran off. And then a whole other team ran on. They went, oh, no, that's offense. And then defense. And I think it's nonsense. It's all just nonsense. <laughs> but then, but there's one thing that NFL I've always wanted to be part of. And it's this here, everyone. It's the huddle. Has anyone ever seen the huddle? Well, if you don't understand it, don't worry, neither does God. But, um, but what you have is the huddle, and it's like a little team time where they all get together, and it's like super encouraging, and they all get there, and they do huddly things like, oh, oh, oh. they all do this, and then they head bang each other, and they do stuff like that. And I want to be part of that. So there's like, I'd love to at some time in life put on, wear the tights, put the tights on that they wear, you know, put all the padding on, you know, it's, it's just rugby for wusses. That's, that's all it is. I'd love to put the whole thing on and I put my helmet on and I'd love to be in the huddle doing huddly stuff. You know, oh, looking at the guys. Oh, yeah. And I'm head banging, but I don't want to get hurt. I don't want anyone running at me, you know, 250 pounds. I just don't want that. I don't, I don't want to get hurt. I don't want to get, I don't want to get hurt. But here's the truth, everyone, is that no one pays money to watch the huddle. They pay money to watch the game. Here's another truth. See what's happening right now? You know what this is? This is the huddle. Worship leader comes out, we're going to worship God today. And everyone goes, ah. Guy comes out, yeah, Reg, yeah. And we all boom, boom. That's what we're doing. We do huddly things. But this is not the game. It's when we go out those doors, everyone, that we go into the game. Yes? And God has called you to the game to share the good news of Jesus Christ. This good news. Blind eyes are going to see. Prisoners are going to be set free. And that's what God has called us to. And please, I don't want you just here as an attender in church. I want you to be an inviter. And here's the really good news. Look at this here. See this Christmas thing. It is like harvest season. You have the opportunity to invite someone to church. How many seats can you have? How many seats are there? Nearly a thousand. We can have it twice. Isn't that right? We could have two thousand. Let's double church in one day. This is not for you to have warm and fuzzy feelings at Christmas. This is for you to bring your neighbors, to bring your dog, to bring your cat, anything that's alive. Just bring them along. Yes? And Gowan's going to wear an elf suit on the day. That is worth coming. But seriously, everyone, why? why? Just don't book a ticket. Everyone, you should be scanning this right now. I mean, I could do like a fancy prayer and whatever. Raise your hand. No, raise your mobile phone right now. Scan this in the name of Jesus. And don't book a ticket, you selfish person. Book two tickets. Book five tickets. Book ten. If there's five of you in your family, you're going to bring another family. Seriously, everybody. Because there's some people out there, and we call them CEOs. CEO, you ready for this? They're CEOs. They come at Christmas, Easter, and other. <laughs> and they are more likely to say that they will come on a Saturday for the warm and fuzzies, promise them a mince pie, and they're going to come to church. Yes? That's where mission starts, everybody. So I want to encourage you. Be full of the Spirit of God. Be full of the Word of God. And be full of the mission of Christ in our lives. 
And you know what? We'll be like Jesus and we'll maybe change our world. God bless you today. Thank you. Thank you.